Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about STI prevention. And my focus is primarily going to be on the HIV prevention arena. Um, and I really hope through this presentation you'll be convinced, if you're not already convinced, of the importance of STI prevention in the context of HIV prevention. I know for many of you it's, it's very overwhelming to think about STI prevention when you're already, uh, very busy with your HIV prevention approaches. Um, and hopefully through this talk you'll see a more simplified approach that can be tailored for different settings and different populations. Um, and I want to remind you that Dr. Papan uh, earlier today said that to reach our goals to end the infection, we need to enhance prevention strategies. And I think STI prevention, improving our STI prevention strategies is one way to do that. Um, this presentation comes on the, on the heels of a perspective piece by Jeannie Marazzo and colleagues um, that uh, I think is very important. And the article begs us to consider STIs and the implications for HIV control. She reminds us of the good thing that modeling suggests that frequent STI screening among MSM and transgender women in the setting of PrEP for HIV prevention might over time drive down STIs, especially, uh, certainly if they're linked to treatment. And one question she asks, which is very Im important, is the high incidence of STI going to undermine PrEP and treatment as prevention in the long term? I hope not. Um, for this presentation, I'm aware of the time getting late, and um, I will provide a background on STIs and HIV, which I, I think is very important for the context of STI prevention in this arena. And I'll focus on syphilis, because certainly for our key population, syphilis is probably the backbone STI we need to consider. I'll talk about the importance of screening connection to treatment. Um, in our CELOM community clinic experience. And an idea of a service delivery model for STI that might be mo somewhat tailored to different settings as I So actually, I do have a few audience questions, and maybe we can get more than six responses <laughs> to these questions. These are to test your STI knowledge. Um, and so I'd like to ask you for the first question. For persons that have HIV, Neisseria gonorrhea urethritis will decrease HIV viral load in the blood, increase HIV viral shedding in the mucosa, neither decreases or increases HIV, there's a typo there, or unsure. So I'd like to ask for your response. Okay, very good. I think we have some good uh, understanding of the urethritis and what happens with the HIV setting. The correct answer is B. And for the next question, um, how long is the most infectious period of syphilis, early syphilis, if left untreated? So we're a little bit all over the place here. The actually correct answer is D, three months or longer. So the reminder is early syphilis is primary or secondary syphilis. And stages can last four months or longer. So the final question to test your STI knowledge is genital ulcer disease increases HIV transmission up to twofold. Is this false, true, or you're unsure? a bit of a trick question. So um, is it false, is it true, or is it unsure? It's actually false. I said up to twofold. So the literature suggests two to fourfold, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here. 
So I think it's really important to point back to the biology. What do we know about STI and HIV? And STIs do play a significant role in facilitating HIV transmission and acquisition. And we know this a number of different studies. A stu studies of GUD where um, there's noted increases of HIV transmission two to fourfold. And as a reminder, GUD can be caused by syphilis, hemophilus, ducry, or herpes. And urethritis, you got this one right, urethritis due to Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia can increase HIV viral shedding. And interestingly, with treatment, treatment reduces HIV viral shedding. And systemic STIs such as syphilis can increase HIV viral load and decrease CD4 count, and treatment has been shown to reduce HIV viral load. Episodic herpes also can increase HIV viral load, and as we showed in Chiang Rai, in, uh, along with other global settings, um, treatment of herpes with acyclovir can reduce viral shedding, HIV viral shedding. And it's also important to note that breaches in mucosa and inflammatory cells and mediators increase the risk of HIV acquisition. So this is a really nice study that was done by Kate Bush and CDC, and um, this shows that syphilis increases HIV viral load and syphilis treatment reduces HIV viral load. This actually is just a case example from this study. Um, in this graph, you can see the titers, syphilis titers in the pink bar, and you can see the HIV viral load in red, and then treatment for syphilis in, use, with the arrows. And you can see there was a significant decline in HIV viral load af after syphilis treatment. I think a really important um, uh, issue is that um, STIs in numerous studies have shown to, have been shown to predict HIV infection or new HIV infection. Um, this, uh, there's a previous study by Kyle Bernstein in, uh, when he was in San Francisco where he showed rectal, repeat rectal STIs increased uh, or predicted HIV. This study also shows the same, that syphilis predicts HIV incidence among men and transgender women who were enrolled in a PrEP trial. And so it's important that STI screening and identification of STIs might actually really help us um, encourage and facilitate PrEP use. Um, it really, this study emphasizes the importance of PrEP um, in these uh, at-risk men and women. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, but I'll go through these slides more quickly because it is late. I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on syphilis because syphilis, I think, is the backbone of um, the STIs we should consider in our key populations. Um, as a reminder, it's acquired by direct contact, and it's a really important um, issue. Is 30 percent or probably more of individuals who are in, in contact with early someone with early syphilis in the preceding 30 days will acquire infection. Um, infection can cross the placenta and can infect the fetus and cause very devastating outcomes. And just a reminder of the stages of syphilis, primary syphilis is classically a chancre, usually on the vulva or the penis, but actually in a lot of populations, um, chancres will be in the oral mucosa, in the rectum, and be hidden. And they are painless, so they might never be detected. Um, secondary syphilis is classically a disseminated rash and lymphadenopathy and many systemic symptoms that often bring um, someone to care. This is the natural history of syphilis as a reminder, infection to primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, and late, latent syphilis, um, tertiary syphilis if left un untreated. So as a reminder, syphilis diagnosis is really based on, um, in most settings now, non-treponemal and treponemal specific tests. These tests are cheap and accessible, and in fact, there are point of care tests available. And, but diagnosis can also require information on clinical presentation, previous treatment history, and previous testing and titers. And confirmation of adequate treatment is really important with repeat testing and documentation of reductions in titer. 
So again, this is sort of a highlight of syphilis diagnostic tests. Um, direct detection methods are great, but not widely available. And these include dark field microscopy and PCR, where you can detect creponema on the, in the, on the mucosa in primary syphilis. Um, and then this is a listing of different non-treponemal tests and treponemal tests. And a reminder about syphilis treatment. For the, the real mainstay for syphilis treatment is benzene penicillin injection. Um, for the most part, that's one injection. For um, uh, late, latent, it's, it can be more than one injection. Um, there's other alternatives, though, that are important to note. Uh, doxycycline um, treatment can be used for treatment. It's been documented to have a um, good serologic response um, in both HIV-infected and uninfected persons. Tetracycline, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin also can be used. But I'll admit, um, there are challenges for syphilis treatment. And um, some of these challenges include that there's been global benzathine penicillin shortages, which make uh, treatment somewhat challenging when the treatment of choice is not available. And around the world, in settings of Asia and South America, there have been concerns about penicillin allergy. I'd like to highlight a little bit about penicillin allergy. I think it's important to highlight some information we know. Um, although about 10% of persons report penicillin allergy, uh, less than 1% actually truly have an IgE-mediated IgE allergy, and even less with anaphylaxis. And this paper that's highlighted here actually says it's less than 0.05% of the population. At CELOM, over the last three years, we've been using benzathine penicillin for treatment of syphilis on site. And after more than 2,400 doses of penicillin, we've had no cases of acute reaction in anaphylaxis. Now, as we've heard today um, in different settings, we are having a global epidemic of syphilis. Um, in the US, syphilis rates have doubled, primarily in men who have sex with men. And now we're seeing new increases recently in congenital syphilis. There are similar increases across the world in Asia, Europe, and Australia. And I'll point to a presentation um, tomorrow on syphilis and HIV, which will highlight some of these unusual presentations for syphilis. But both neurosyphilis and ocular syphilis has been documented. Um, and these both can have devastating consequences. Now, bringing it back to our part of the world, Bangkok, I wanted to highlight the prevalence of various STIs in our Bangkok MSM cohort study, or BMCS. And as you can see, we had a number of STIs, um, herpes, uh, syphilis, urethral, chlamydia, and Neisseria gonorrhea of significant prevalences. So I wanted to kind of point back to STI screening in HIV prevention settings and, and what is um, recommended. Now, different settings, regions recommend different things, but STI screening and treatment is recommended for, in many settings, for, H, for those with HIV, at least annually. Um, and STI screening is also recommended as a part of PrEP provision. Most guidelines, at least at initiation in every six months, some guidelines every three months. But despite, despite these screening recommendations, um, I think our screenings are suboptimal. Um, in the United States, a uh, recent study um, highlighted that even those HIV-infected persons who care um, are not getting completely screened. About 20 to 30 percent were not screened for various STIs. So I just want to um, go back to the HIV prevention toolbox. We have a number of really effective strategies. Mm -hmm. How do we go back? There. Um, and I, I want to also frame a lot of what I'm talking about. It's um, on the. It's, it's framed within the approaches that we have available, including condoms and counseling. Um, we have these great approaches: PrEP treatment as prevention. And I want to um, highlight how screening and early treatment is also a very important part of the toolbox. 
So what are the benefits of STI screening and treatment for HIV prevention? So STI screening and treatment can reduce the likelihood of HIV acquisition and transmission, and of course it reduces STI transmission. Screening and treatment can engage clients in their care, and I heard some mention of this around framing a sexual health or comprehen comprehensive health and prevention package, and certainly STI screening and treatment fits within that. I think our clients, um, the men in our clinic especially, want, they want to have the screening and they want to have this information. It's an opportunity to reinforce prevention counseling, um, and STI might be a trigger to support um, uh, behavior change or facilitate prevention approaches that weren't considered before. And it's also an opportunity to identify those at highest risk for uh, biomedical HIV prevention approaches such as PrEP, as I highlighted earlier. And the, the final thing is supporting partner screening and treatment. Now, partner notification of an STI could bring a partner into the clinic or other setting for STI screening and HIV screening. So diagnosis of STIs needs to connect to treatment, so, and why? Now, certainly if the STI is diagnosed and treatment is not done soon, transmission can continue in the community. And I just want to remind you about what maybe our clients do on New Year's in Bangkok. And this is an example of a sexual network. Um, and although m many gay men and transgender women have sexual networks of on the right here. Um, simple networks with a few nodes, and every node is a partner. There are there can be more complex networks with many partners and different nodes um, connecting to each other. And this is just an example of how over time there's opportunities for new sex sexual partners, more sex, and um, potential trans. And as a reminder, back to our st the statistics of transmission of infections, um, we use the reproductive rate or the number of cases one case generates on average over the course of the infectious period in an un otherwise an uninfected population to help us understand transmission of, of infections in general and HIV infection. And this is influenced by a number of things, including the rate of the contacts the probability of infection being transmitted during the contact, and the duration of infectiousness. And so certainly STIs can influence this through infectiousness. Time to treatment really does matter, just like it does for HIV. I've been hearing a lot about um, early treatment, same-day treatment, um, same-day tr prep, and early treatment of syphilis is important. I, I'd like to give two examples. One example is the time to treatment is one day, and then the time to treatment is one month. So if the time to treatment for an STI is one day, it has minimal, if any, impact on HIV transmission or STI transmission. Um, you're arresting the infection, it's being treated. But if the time to treatment is one month, there's opportunity for transmission events, with, and um, there's also increased infectiousness. So in one month, there might be 10 sex acts, with 30% transmission of syphilis and three new syphilis cases. And if, if a person is HIV positive, there might be an HIV transmission up to fourfold with um, sex act. HIV negative, there may, may be the increased uh, acquisition risk of HIV due to ulcerations or infl inflammation. So I'd like to highlight our Salem Community Clinic um, experience um, around treatment and treatment delays. Um, and I, I think this will highlight the importance of timely treatment and that referrals can mean treatment delays. Seawong Community Clinic is in Bangkok, Thailand and serves men who sex with men and transgender women for HIV testing, STI testing, and same-day treatment. And in Bangkok, the good news is we've had more PrEP availability and more in um, ART treatment. And this has meant increases in STI screening. But many settings don't, aren't able to provide comprehensive STI service, and referrals have been coming from the community to Ceylon for treatment. 
So just this is an example of our referrals for syphilis treatment over the last few years. Um, we've seen over a six-fold increase in STI treatment referrals, so uh, men and women coming in specifically for syphilis treatment. Um, many of these coming in for treatment have high titers, and high titers can be indicative of early uh, syphilis infection and also be more likely to be transmitted. And at CELOM, we've noted 80% of those coming in with referral letters had a titer of one to eight. And this is an important slide on referrals for syphilis treatment and, and what it might mean for treatment delays. On the x-axis is the cumulative number of clients, and on the y-axis is the number of days from first uh, screen treatment for syphilis. And you can see that most lie on that uh, zero line, zero to one, meaning that they're treated within one day. But you can see any of those above one day are treatment delays. Um, the median treatment delay was four days. We saw um, persons that had delays 323 days and, some, and uh, 20 plus days and hundreds of days. So just in summary, we're seeing um, an increase in this is reflective of the really great HIV prevention approaches that are available in the community. Um, it's important that, that the STI screening be connected to treatment. Um, and it's really important that an STI service delivery model be used in the HIV prevention context. And I'll admit, I don't know exactly what this might mean for your setting, but I think it's important to consider, and I think it can be tailored for different settings. What does a service delivery model mean? It means inclusion of STI screening, diagnosis, treatment, and management in the HIV prevention activity. Um, and it can be flexible and fluid to the environment, resources, population, priorities of the program. But most importantly, it's comprehensive. And so this is an example of what I might consider a service delivery model where screening, diagnosis, and treatment and management are all a part of the comprehensive care. For screening, in our key population, syphilis is backbone for sure, but optimally Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia at sites of exposure, and viral hepatitis. I'm well aware that um, screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea is challenging with NATs that are expensive and delays in diagnosis. Um, point of care tests feasible are really optimal because that's a golden opportunity when you have your um, client, patient in the office there with you to be able to have same day diagnosis and treatment. For diagnosis, it's important to consider history. For, for syphilis, we need to understand history of treatment. Um, and getting timely test results are important, but sometimes consultation is important too. Um, consulting with experts to confirm diagnosis. Preferably on-site, oral, and, and, and injectable options for treatment are available and are free or inexpensive. Management is important too, and I think it's, it's important to close the loop, um, track that treatment has occurred, follow-up testing, partner notification, and connect to HIV prevention strategies if, if that is of interest. So just an example, since syphilis I'm considering as the backbone, um, this could be considered a syphilis model where screening is done with starting with either a non-treponemal or a treponemal test. I prefer the algorithm where non-treponemal tests precede treponemal tests, but there's different opinion. And preferably point of care testing so you can get the result right when um, that the person is waiting. And then you can make the diagnosis there with his examination and consult if necessary, and provide treatment on the spot with on-site benzathine penicillin and or doxycycline, with the caveat that doxycycline be provided for those that can be compliant with therapy. But also management, ensuring treatments could be 
completed. If it's on site, that's easy, but if you refer, it's important to follow. Follow up testing date, partners contacted, and if HIV negative, prep. So to further the, the idea of a service delivery model for STI, I think there's several steps that need to happen. And part of it is routinizing STI screening with HIV testing, prep, and, and treatment as prevention. And considering models that work for the specific environment and population. I think we need training of providers and key populations and those that provide HIV prevention on an optimal STI service. I think we need to support same-day diagnosis and same-day treatment for optimal service delivery. It's not always feasible or possible, but it's optimal. And management um, and tracking. I think we need to mobilize stakeholders for resources to support STI screening as a part of HIV prevention and engage our community partners on the importance of STI service. So I just want to harken back to the fact that STIs are important and they do increase the risk of HIV transmission and acquisition. They're a very important part of the HIV prevention toolbox. A number of beneficial uh, be benefits of STI screening and treatment in the HIV prevention environment, reducing likelihood of HIV transmission and acquisition, improving engagement and care, and reinforcing prevention messaging, and connecting those that are negative to HIV prevention that really work, like PrEP. And then, of course, screening and treating partners. And I just want to... Um, uh, well, thank my, the program. This is our pro HIV STD research program. And thank a number of people that have helped me think about this uh, presentation. Thank you very much.